Uh, the Ready by 21 challenge, ensuring that every young person is ready for college, work, uh, and life. And I just want to start by saying that, that for the past four or five years, we've really been, as, as Dale said, playing with how do you communicate more readily and easily what it is that our goal is. We, you know, for years, I mean, I, people, I will stand up and people will say, well, you know, you're the grandmother of youth development. And that may be true, but walking into a policy office or walking into uh, a corporate office to say, I'm here to talk about youth development, people's eyes would sort of glaze over and not know what that was. Somehow people understand early childhood development, but youth development seemed to be this fuzzy thing. And so we really looked for sort of an outcomes-driven way to get the conversation started. And what resonated was making sure that young people are ready for college, work, and life, and picking 21 not as the end goal, but something that at least gets, us, gets our toe in the second decade and acknowledges that the work doesn't end when young people graduate from high school. So that's really where the, that's the scientific reasoning behind Ready by, the Ready by 21 challenge. So let me talk to you a little bit about the conclusions that we've come to. Some of these slides are decades old and some of them are, were done last week. Uh, but this has been an ongoing process of figuring out how we really communicate uh, what we know needs to happen for young people. Um, so I'm gonna slip, flip to the first slide and hope folks catch up with me. And here we come. Okay. As I, as I near retirement, I get angrier. So I started to put this slide up um, because my, my impatience is coming up. And, and, and doing the work that we've done for years, it started to crystallize what we really think the challenge is. And the challenge, and we were talking about this last night at dinner, the challenge is that here in the United States, we have a very ambitious dream. We have a dream and a belief that every young person can be ready, that every family and community can be supportive, and that each of our leaders can be effective in helping the first two things happen. And we really believe that, and that's our rhetoric. The reality, however, is that we're really not anywhere close to that dream. That you can stick in any data that you want, but only four in 10 young people, more or less, are really ready for college, work, and life. Only one in three are supported if we look at the America's Promise Every Child, Every Promise survey that's happened. And I don't have an exact number for the leaders, but if the first two numbers are what they are, leaders can't be too effective uh, in being able to help us move these things along. Now, that doesn't mean that we aren't trying. It just means that our efforts somehow aren't netting the results that really represent our dream. All right, we all know that things aren't perfect and that we have to make progress, so what's the challenge? The challenge really is that I think in this country we have a dilemma that we're not very angry about the fact that we're not closing the gap between the reality and our dream. That we all go to work every day thinking that if we could just do a little incremental thing to help a couple of kids get a little bit better, that that's sort of what we can do. Fragmentation, complacency, low expectations of young people, of their families, of communities, of our leaders, have led us into a place where trying is about the best we can do. And to quote the title of Mark Friedman's book, The Results-Based Accountability Good Guru, trying isn't good enough. Um, you know, or the title of another book by the Hope Foundation, you know, hope, failure is not an option. Somehow we have to make the transformation in our personal lives, in our organizational lives, in our community lives, to thinking if we just get up and try, things will get better slowly, to really deciding we really have to th figure out how to think differently, how to act differently, and how to act together to change what we do so that we're really realizing that dream in our lifetimes, and certainly in young people's lifetimes. So that's really what the Ready by 21 challenge is, as, as we had to crystallize it. Lots of tools, lots of framework, lots of data, lots of things to help people, but the challenge really is to take on individually, organizationally, and as communities, to take on the challenge of really changing the odds for young people by changing the way we do business. And that really means that we have to start with our behavior. We can start with the list of youth outcomes and the trends on what's getting better and what's getting worse, but the bottom line is just grabbing your favorite indicator. Oh, the teen pregnancy rate's gone up or the dropout rate's gone up or you know, the binge drinking rate has gone up. Let's go work on that. We've been doing that for a long time. Grabbing a particular outcome or age group in that youth circle, grabbing a particular setting and, and support that we want to offer in the community or with their families, and grabbing a group of leaders to help us and making a little initiative that's going to attack something. And what's happened along the way is we've fragmented things to the point that we really aren't 
moving that big wheel. Young people aren't getting better. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that idea, um, put up some slides to help us sort of let that idea wash over us, that we are all doing things, and we're all doing important things, but we're not adding them up in a way that we're really getting the horsepower out of them that we need to make a big difference, and we're not setting our goals big enough, that it's not just about working with the young people we work with on the problem that we care about, but it's adding all these things up in consistent ways. And that means that we have to make a commitment as a collective to accept, expect adequate progress from young people across a range of outcome areas. You can name them whenever they want, but clearly we have to help young people make progress in learning and working and thriving and connecting and in ultimately leading and contributing in their communities across age groups from when they're little to when they're big. We've got to make sure that they have adequate supports. The America's Promise list is up there, but we could put up the National Research Council list. If we had room, we could squeeze in the 20 assets um, that are the external assets. Across all the settings where they spend time, including families and informal supports in their neighborhoods and then formal programs, and then obviously the systems if they end up spending time in public systems other than schools. And then we have to implement a range of change strategies and make sure that all, t all stakeholders are taking shared responsibility for this work. So that's really what I'm going to talk about for the next half hour, and then we'll go to the panel and see if all this makes sense. But as we've moved over the years, and I've been at this for a long time, from thinking that really what we had to do was to help people understand what youth development was, and if they just understood it, they would do better. We've done that. Then we thought, well, maybe they really need to understand what supports need to be available to help youth development, and we did that for a while, that middle circle. And America's Promise really made an enormous contribution to the country by giving us language about that middle circle and being doggedly consistent about the language. So if those five promises resonate with you, as they do with many people across the country, we have a set of things, and the message was you can't just pick one. Young people need all of these things in their lives as much as possible in the settings where they spend their time. We need that same crisp definition of outcomes so that we know what we're aiming for. Um, but mainly right now, what we need is a new definition of what good leadership is. Uh, and that's what we want to focus on. So the big picture approach, uh, as we talk about it, is really an effort to get people to not think about one gear at a time, if you want to sort of buy this gear analogy, but to really think across all three and first take aim, have a clear set of definitions about what you're trying to do in each of those. What it means for young people to be prepared to be ready for college, work, and life, and how that translates into the age groups. What it means for families and communities to be supportive, what it really looks like, what the indicators of that are. And then what it means for effective leadership. And if we understand and have language around all of those, then we can come back to our communities and ask, well, how well are we doing against that? Then we can come back and make plans in all three of those gears to do better. And again, that keeps the focus on, if we don't change the way we do business as leaders, we won't change the outcomes for young people. We can make a plan, but if we don't change what we do, we're not going to get changes on the other side. And then obviously we have to track progress, and we have to track progress in as public a way as possible. So that's the overview of what this Ready by 21 challenge is. It's about thinking differently, acting differently, and ultimately acting together to change the odds for young people as leaders, whether we are leading programs, we're leading organizations, we're leading governments, we're leading businesses, and obviously we're leading families. So let's talk a little bit about what's behind this, about what we know about young people. Well, here comes a slide that's really, I think, at this point, 20 years old that, that Dale mentioned. We certainly have to broaden the goals beyond prevention. Addressing youth problems is critical. That's where we have the data. That's where we get momentum. That's where the papers pick up the news that some trend is going in the wrong direction. And someone says, oh, we have to do something about this. So addressing youth problems is critical, not just because that's where we have the data, but obviously addressing youth problems is critical. But problem-free isn't fully prepared. And this is where we need the work. This is where we don't have the clear definitions. So again, now going back to things that I've been saying for a decade, so I apologize to those who have been following me around. Hi, Dick, close your ears. Um, but since I pointed him out, if I say to you, here's Dick. He's 19 years old. He's not a dropout. I know that's stretching it, but he's not a dropout. He's not a drug user. He doesn't have a criminal record. He's not a teen parent. Will you hire him? What do you say? What can he do? Yeah, I mean, I didn't tell you <laughs> that he was prepared for anything. I told you that he doesn't have a set of problems that could have 
had an impact on how prepared he was or could have an impact on his ability to actually come in and do the job, whether that job is uh, making his way through college or that job is actually employment. Now, I will tell you that since I've been asking, posing that little scenario and asking that question over the past 20 years, the number of people in the audience who have said yes has gone up steadily. So we're going in the wrong direction. Our expectations of young people are so low that people just say, yeah, that's, that's a good start. You know, that's, that's better than what I thought. I'll take that young person who at least is stable and doesn't have problems. And then I think, as a business leader, that what I have to do is actually get them prepared. So we really do need to communicate a message. We really do need to engage our young people in helping us both articulate their vision and expectations about what they want to look like at 16, at 18, at 21, because they're not happy just being problem free. They actually want to be fully prepared, and as Dale said, and I don't have that slide to put up next, the other piece that should fly up on here is they want to be fully engaged. One of the things that we know about development and one of the things that we've learned steadily as we've brought young people into this conversation is that they don't think about this linearly. They don't think, I need to sit in a chair and have people talk to me for 12 years so that I can go out and do something. They want to know why what they're learning is relevant for what they are able to do now. They want this back and forth. So we talk about rigor and relevance and relationships and all those other R words, and they're very important for making this a very lively and active cycle of preparation and development, which assumes from the beginning that young people can make contributions you know, from their early years all the way through and invites them to make those contributions. So problem-free isn't fully prepared, and fully prepared the way we've been doing it isn't good enough for young people because they're not fully engaged. We could talk more about that later on if you like. Let's talk for a second about that idea that young people aren't doing well. And since I already gave you the numbers, I'm just going to slip to the one that has the numbers in it. This is research that, that was done by Michelle Gambone and Jim Connell a couple of years ago. They looked at several longitudinal studies and those of you who want to know the footnotes, we can we give those to you later. But they looked at several longitudinal studies that tracked young people from their early teens into their early 20s. They did lots of fancy stuff with the data. And they really tried to identify two groups of young people, those who were doing well and those who weren't. And then they did a lot of studies on those two groups to understand what the differences were in their lives that led them on a trajectory that landed them where we'd like young people to be, according to our dream, or landed them off track. They also helped look at, look at this data to identify things that clustered under that definition of doing well. So as they looked at it, doing well fell into three categories. Productivity, and then these definitions were age appropriate. If we're looking at high school students, productivity meant that they were attending school regularly and they were getting good grades and they were actually uh, motivated uh, and connected to school. For young adults, productivity meant attending college or working steadily. In the health area, it meant that they had good health, they had good health habits, they had healthy relationships uh, with peers and adults. And in the connectedness area, the third one where things clustered, they were doing something outside of their immediate family. They were volunteering, they were politically active, they were engaged in a religious community or in civic organizations. They were doing something outside of themselves to be connected to their community in some way. So three pretty basic definitions, you can play with the language of what it actually means to be doing well. You're productive, you're healthy, you're connected. And with those definitions, and what they found was that when they, when they did this research, young people who were doing well were doing well in two of those three areas and not doing poorly in any. On the converse side, young people who were really in trouble were doing poorly in two of those areas and not doing well in any. And on the other side, as you can see and you have the slides, those young people who were having difficulty were either had a high school diploma or less, they were unemployed, they were on welfare. Just having a high school diploma didn't qualify you as not being productive. That was in combination with being unemployed or being on welfare. They had the opposite poor health, they were engaged in risky behaviors or unsupportive relationships, and at the connectedness level, they were disconnected to the point that they were committing illegal activities. So not doing well really meant not doing well, sort of our definition of disconnected young people. Doing well is that definition of the American dream. We want young people to be working or in college. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be connected somehow in their community. Against that basic definition, they found only four in 10 young people were doing well. Only four in 10. And so I ask you, does that surprise you? 
If you were to think here in Minnesota, and you were to come up with a number, how many of you would think that with that definition, which you have in front of you, you would say that seven or more young people in Minnesota are doing well by that basic definition of doing well? How many people would say seven or more? Hands up, way up so we can see you. I see about six, seven hands, okay? How many would say five or six? You're over the halfway point, okay? How many would say four or less? All right, so you all think somewhere in the middle, you'd like you're a little bit better than the national average, or you've got five or six young people that you think are doing well. All right, so you may be doing better than a lot of communities. I have been in communities where people, where the majority of people thought three or less. So I can just tell you the range. You have this conversation in Los Angeles, nobody puts their hand up until we get to three. So, but even here, um, you know, in a state that's doing a lot for young people where you think young people are doing well, you're basically, the majority of you are saying you think about half of our young people are a little more doing well by a basic definition that really is the American dream. And so, while I can say you're doing better than most communities, or you think you are, you still have a long way to go. But that's all young people, and we won't go through the exercise, but think about those subgroups of young people who typically are the least ready, and ask yourself how many of them would be doing well. And we won't stop to do this, but again, that global figure of how well young people are doing, you need to go right under it and ask, is that true of all young people? Those who are coming out of foster care, those who are disabled, those who are in uh, your low income inner cities, is it true of young people in all income areas? Is it true of all young people by race and ethnicity? When you disaggregate that group of young people, you start to see where you have pockets and challenges or problems and where you need to focus your efforts. What's behind those numbers? Well, if we want young people to be doing well at 21 or 22 or 23, they actually have to be doing well all along the way. So I'll just ask you quickly, when you think about early childhood, when you think about young people zero to five, how many of you think seven or more young people in their early years are doing well? Think about zero to five-year-olds, how many of them are doing well? Interesting. No? So you think your problems are starting right there uh, in the early years. How many of you think really it's sort of four or less young people, zero to five, are doing well? So, you most, so again, you're mostly in the middle, I'm guessing, by the lack of hands. You're thinking five or six. In a lot of communities, what you find, and again, these are exercises you could do to sort of go back locally into your conversations, what you find is sort of a deterioration um, of effort, that people think little kids are doing pretty well because they've had an early childhood initiative that's been going on for a long time, but that as they go up the age group, they actually, their, their expectations and their, their thinking about whether young people are doing well goes down. So again, could be different here, but it's just the question of if you really want to start to dissect an aggregate number of how many young people are doing well, first of all, it's important to have a number like that. Even if it's not absolutely accurate, even if it doesn't meet Dale Blyce and the University of Minnesota standards for research, from a communication value, it's really very important to have something, I know that the, teens, the Minnesota Teen Survey just came out. That's lots of valuable data, but anybody can pick, I could pick it up and say, wow, things are actually getting better because these six things are going up. It's going in the right direction, and I could, somebody else could pick it up and say, boy, we're really not doing well because these six things are going down. And what happens when we hand people lots of independent indicators, to read is they don't get an overall picture of what, but how well are young people doing? What, are, what does all this data mean? So we need some way from a communication perspective in the same way that America's Promise just hammering away, kids need these five basic things. We need some way to actually have language um, and help communities understand in a simple way what we mean by doing well at different age groups how many young people are doing well, and then from there, disaggregate those numbers. So you can disaggregate them by age, you could disaggregate them across areas, and you also then need to sort of pull out doing well. This is pulling it out by cognitive, vocational, physical, social, whatever. Whatever you do, what I'm giving you is a glimpse of the kind of tools and exercises that we suggest that communities do to get a handle on how well are your young people actually doing. How well are they doing by age, by outcome, by different groups? Once you have a sense of how you're doing overall, once you have a clear vision of what it is that you think you're defining as doing well, then you start to ask the question, how well are they doing? So the bottom line is there are some core assumptions that we, we have about young people. We have a belief that we need to invest in young people from when they're little to big. 
We need to invest in them from when they wake up to when they go to sleep year-round. We need to invest in them and provide the range of supports, five promises, National Research Council list, assets, whatever you want to call it, the range of supports that we know they need in order to grow and develop. We need to invest in them across the settings where they spend their time, formal and informal, voluntary and involuntary. We need to invest in them across all those goals from making sure that they're out of trouble, the deep prevention side, all the way up to their prepared and participating across a range of outcomes from academic to civic and social. And then we clearly need to pay attention to young people who have special challenges. Everything that we know about development says, if you're going to really make a plan to help young people be ready for college, work, and life, your plan has to include those elements. You can decide how you define them, you can decide what you call them, but if you make a plan that pick and chooses them, picks and chooses among those, you haven't made an adequate plan based on what we know about growth and development. So if you've given that, the other things that we would suggest that we suggest that communities do are to now take the, that list, take that list that's up there, and start to pull them out in twos. Because one of the things that we've learned is that and you know, I, I will claim that I have occasionally thought in four dimensions, but I, I, I won't, it's, it's not pretty. I won't, I won't share it with you. But when we just think one-dimensionally, we tend to make a lot of fragmented efforts. We at least need to think in two dimensions. So I'm going to suggest and just show you quickly what happens if you say, well, let's actually first define the goals for young people by outcome by age. What do we really think it looks like for a 6 to 12 year old? Where should they be cognitively? Where should they be in terms of vocational development? Where they're not working, but what should they know about the world of work? What should they have experienced? What do we think needs to happen if we were actually to be able to def define the developmental trajectories from little to big across the outcome areas that we know are important for young people? Now again, you can put whatever language into the chart that you want. That's your first task. What language are you using in Minnesota or in your communities? But you need to do this work. Suppose you did that work, you defined the indicators, and then you went out and took stock, the second step. And this is just random. I color them in randomly. And you found out that, wow, in your community, once you define what you wanted it to look like, you really had some places where you were doing well. That's the green. You had some places where your numbers were OK. And you had some places where your numbers really weren't good. What do people typically do when they've done this kind of a needs assessment, whether they put it into a grid or a matrix like this or not? Once you've identified some places that you're not doing well, what do, what do people typically do? Anybody? Yeah. Throw money at it? What else do you do? Yep, you usually pick one of them. One to three is that magic number. Let's pick one thing to work on. Maybe let's pick three. But if you get more than three red spots up on your chart after you've done your community needs assessment or you've looked at that teen survey data or whatever, the typical response that we found in communities is we have to focus. And focus means pick one or two or three of these things and let's throw money at that concentrated thing for a while. And we may not use the word throw money, but let's invest in that concentrated thing for a while and see if we can make a difference in that thing. So let's say that we picked children in our school ready to learn. And we said, wow, everything that we know from the research tells us that if we don't get young people entering school ready to learn, the rest of that chart isn't going to change. Let's focus all of our energy on that. Let's say that we do that. Major initiative, three years worth of work. We use Mark Friedman's results-based decision making, and we figure out how we're going to turn the curve, and we do the baselines and all that. And if you all don't know the results-based accountability stuff, it's worth looking at. It's a very solid approach for making a plan for how you're going to improve a particular indicator. And I love Mark Friedman. And the challenge that I think we have to picking one indicator and saying we're going to turn the curve on it is that we've now done it. We turn the curve, and we actually move that number into the green space for us. So maybe now 7 out of 10 or higher of young people who are coming into kindergarten are actually ready for kindergarten, and we feel very good. Problem is, we come back five years later to do the needs assessment, and everything else <laughs> went down. Because we focused on one thing. When the rest of the world didn't stop, the rest of the kids didn't stop, the rest of us doing whatever we were doing didn't stop. And what happens is, you can get all that community momentum, we can say all of this is important for young people, we can identify who the people are that are working in all of those spaces, and when we pick one thing to focus on and don't give the rest of us an opportunity to stay at the table, 
And, and I can stay at the table saying, hey, I agree that that's the primary focus, but I don't want to be ignored. What happens is the other folks go off, they tend to get less resources, they lose momentum, and we may actually slip in other areas. So our suggestion in terms of what it is for us that we call big picture thinking and planning is that we do need to focus, but we need to focus on the big picture. We need to actually take aim and say this is what we want, this is what we want it to look like in terms of what the indicators are for young people across outcomes, across age groups. We're going to do the same on what the indicators of success are across settings, across the supports that young people need to have. We, get, we take stock, we look at that picture, we see where we have problems, but when we decide to take action, we don't just pick one cell. We decide how we're going to take action and what we'd like that whole picture to look like three years or five years later. And then people have energy to work on those things. And of course the folks who are in the green spaces, their job is to keep that space from going to yellow. Their job is to keep doing what they're doing, make sure that they make modest improvements continuously, and come back and work with the other folks um, to make connections and pull them along. So you can see that there's a difference in thinking we do a community needs assessment, we find out all this data, we get all these people in a room who care passionately about their cell, we pick one cell, the rest of the community sort of dissipates because we didn't pick their cell. That's the way we do business now. The challenge is to change the way we do business to think about this differently. So that's what we mean by sort of using the big picture approach to do business differently, to take on this challenge of helping young people really be ready for college work and life, which means that we have to invest and pay attention to them from little to big, from when they wake up to when they go to sleep, across the places where they spend their time to make sure that they have the supports that they need. Does that make sense? Does anybody have a question or comment before I go into how do we do this stuff? They're all still, oh, yes. Blending resources? Yes, absolutely. That is the plan. That is the challenge. <laughs> that we, we sometimes have large amounts of resources that have been focused in on one cell. Um, and the, the more detailed work around the, the tools that we bring in to everything from state governments to neighborhood coalitions really help you actually unbundle that work. But the challenge is that everything that you touch has to be put through this kind of youth-centered lens. Um, and I'll touch on some of that and then we can come back and talk more about that and I'm sure the panel can have some things to say about it. But that's, that's your, your, your assumption is right. That's exactly what this is leading to. Everybody at the table has to put what they do into the same pictures using the same language, track their resources and their commitments, and then figure out what they have. And the, the good news is that when people do this, you actually get movement faster. Um, because people, one, get recognized for doing things that nobody knew they were doing because their label was the Department of Aging, but they were actually running a transportation system uh, and using it to move kids around in preschool, or the good news is that people get help. Um, so we can come back and talk about that more later. But yes, that, that is the deal. So what do we know about community supports? Well, basically what we know, and I'm going to just sort of build this, is that young people grew up in families. That's a family across the bottom of the page. We know that, we can certainly put this up privately, but we know that publicly, on the public side, we have major systems that, again, are trying to prov put programs and services in place to support families and support the individual members in those families. We know that those programs have names as they're put together. Some of those are funding streams, some of those are actual service programs. But the, the dirty little secret is, we don't know what a mess that we've made after we've done this. This is a real picture of what it looks like when a family in Los Angeles, if, when they identified the services and supports that that family really could use, and they figured out the number of applications and forms that family would have to fill out in order to access the services that they need. So this is why we have to think differently and act differently and act together. Because continuing to do business as usual to make up you know, our own little program with a funding stream and a set of staff that are going to work with a specific population that's represented in that family um, to deliver one thing 
really makes it almost impossible for that family to get the supports that they need, makes it almost impossible for us to fit our goal, fill our goal, that American dream of young people really being ready and families and communities being supportive. So this is why we have this dilemma between, wow, we're busy, we have this phone book of programs and services, we're spending money, but we're not getting the results. That's really why we're not getting the results. So the idea that we see a problem, we create a task force, we create a program around all of those issues is what we have to look at. Even in the smallest communities when we've gone in and invited people to do an inventory of the initiatives that are in place, you get upwards, you know, a small community can have more than 30 different initiatives. People coming together, you know, you've got a task force on early childhood, you've got a task force on youth violence, you've got a task force on whatever, there's a little bit of money, there's an agenda, there's a plan. This is what we do over and over again. And what we're not doing as a result is really making sure that young people have the core supports and opportunities that they need in the places where they spend their time. Because we've fragmented the picture so much and we've lost accountability on what really matters. Do young people have the supports they need in the places where they spend their time? And do we even know where they spend their time? So what are those supports? The National Research Council tells us these are the supports that young people need to have in those places where they spend their time. You have the list, safety, structure, relationships, chances to belong, social norms, support for efficacy and mattering. That's that feeling that you can make a difference now. You can do something. Opportunities for skill building across a range of areas. And then finally, integration between family, school, and community efforts. The young people, people aren't bounced back and forth as they move between those three major spheres of their lives. Do these supports matter? Yes. Obviously, we all know they matter. We want them for our children. The question is, do they really matter? Can we prove it? Can we start to talk this language or talk the five promises language and say with some assurance, if we provided young people with those basic supports, if we made sure that the places where they spend their time, from schools to youth organizations to families to summer jobs to recreation centers, if we made sure that those places were providing those supports, in addition to whatever content they were trying to offer, would it make a difference? The answer is yes. We can, again, we can do that same exercise for the settings where they spend their time. We often don't have a clean language around where young people spend their time. After we say schools, we get to this vague thing of community. Well, what does that mean for a young person to spend their time in community? Can you all define what the key places in your communities are that you actually want to track and hold accountable for those supports? Can you add them up? Again, when we do exercises and ask people whether the places where young people are spending their time are doing good or doing harm, in every group that we've been, we've had people say there are places where young people spend their time, voluntarily or involuntarily, that actually do harm. And one of those places too often is school. But that's a different conversation we can come back to have. That's the kind of exercise that you could do to find out whether just to sort of get the conversation going. And again, a challenge here is how do we think differently? I'm trying to get people angry. How is a community, if you actually sat here, did the polling as 100 people, and found that 40% of you thought that schools were actually doing harm in some, some of these basic developmental areas, would you be forced to do something about it? That's the question. Can we actually provide tools that generate conversation and discussion across a broad range of people to get them to not just vaguely care about young people, but care about the gap between the reality that we put young people in and the dream that we have for them. So, a range of partners and settings. You can see yourselves up there hopefully somewhere. If not, when you get this slide adjusted, but from ju juvenile justice to child welfare, et cetera, all of those folks need to be brought to the table. One of the things that happens is that often, depending on our definition of what we think the problem is, we don't bring all the players to the table. So we're constantly forming and reforming committees and groups that never have everybody there. Uh, and someone's always left out, and people left out often have things to offer. Hopefully that made sense. That's how we have to think differently. That's how we have to engage stakeholders. Let's talk a little bit about what we actually know about leadership and what we need to do. We need to think big. Again, incremental change is easy, but it's annoying. <laughs> I mean, the, the quote says it fancier than that, but really, it, it, it is annoying to those people, whether they are families or they are advocates um, or they are young people themselves, to the people who really can see what the reality is, claims that we've made incremental progress just start to get annoying over time. 
Here's an unexpected finding, and I wanted to put it up because it's from a reputable place, the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Again, it's back to this idea that we have to focus in order to make change. They studied those things called comprehensive community, uh, community, community change efforts. Um, when communities try to come together as a whole community and tackle something uh, and make a difference at the community level. And what they found was one, those things were hard to do, there's no doubt about it, it's hard to do those things, but they found that the ones that tackled, set a big goal and tackled it, were no more likely to be successful or unsuccessful than the ones that picked a very narrow goal. So again, what they found was it wasn't whether you picked one cell and said, we're going to work on that, or whether you said, hey, we're going to make a plan to work on the whole picture. There were other things that determined whether that community change effort was successful. I'm going to skip to the Harvard Business School uh, because I think, for me, this is one of those theories that resonates and can be brought from an organization up to a community level to suggest that we actually do have a clue as to why we're not successful. The Harvard Business School looked at major companies that were trying to do major change efforts, whether they were trying to change their product line um, or they were trying to change their business model, whatever they were trying to change, and then asked, why are some companies successful and others not? And after doing all that stuff that business schools do, case studies, et cetera, they came up with this formula, that the degree to which change happened was equal to the level of dissatisfaction with the status quo, where people really unhappy with what was going on, times the clarity of the vision of what they were going to change to, times the adequacy of the plan of how they were going to get there. That that's how we get change. You have to be dissatisfied, you have to have a clear picture of what you'd like it to look like, and you have to have a plan that you believe is actually adequate enough. For if you made the effort, you would get where you're going. Now, I would suggest that we do that in communities, except if you go back to that picture of the scary slide with all the lines, we do it over and over again hundreds of times. We grab a little thing we're dissatisfied about. I don't like that number. The teen smoking rate went up. We make a vision. We'd like the number to look different. We'd like young people not to smoke. We pull a group together. We make a plan. We've done that over and over again so many times. My personal conclusion is that the more we focus in the old way that we do focusing, the more we fragment our responses and our energy and our advocacy, and the more we fail children and youth. Now, you guys can stand up and object and say, no, it's working fine in Minnesota. But in most of the places where I've been, the source of the problem is how we actually conceive going about to make change. That's the heart of the problem. We think incrementally. We think small. We think we don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of support. We better pick a little thing and work on it. And doing that over and over again may make us feel better, but it's not moving the dial for young people. So we need to align the gears. You've got all of those folks who have a stake in this at the state and local level, from advocates to school administrators, et cetera. We're going to have a panel of them up here in a minute to talk about whether this makes sense. All of those folks need to be engaged. But it's not just a question of all of them saying they're doing something for kids, because all of them can say we're doing something for kids. The question is whether we have the same basic thoughts about what we need to do for kids, whether our actions are actually coordinated, and whether we're looking for the maximum number of opportunities to actually act together. So Ready by 21 is an alternative approach to leadership that helps us actually act together. And very quickly, the idea is that we create that big picture vision, we create big tent partnerships that bring all of those folks together, and they know why they're together, and then we define big impact strategies. We define and take on strategies that we know are going to make a difference, and that's not just making up a pilot project. Uh, it's not just small things. It's things that actually improve the quality uh, and the coordination of all the programs where kids spend their time, that align all of our policies, not just our discretionary funds. <laughs> we don't dabble around the edges. Well, we can't touch that pot, and we can't touch this pot, but we'll look at the discretionary dollars that we have and see if we can make a difference. It's things that mobilize community demand and engage young people and families in authentic ways in it. And all of that has to be based on a sense of shared accountability. It's not you messed up or I messed up. It's we have to do this together um, in order to do that. And ultimately, that means that we have to think differently about who coordinates the show, who connects the dots between all those pieces. And those are the people who actually are comfortable thinking big. And there have been studies about boundary spanners and people like that. There are some people for whom ambiguity is stressful, and there are some people for whom ambiguity is challenging. Um, and you want to create, you want to identify change makers and create structures that actually thrive in ambiguity, because this is ambiguous stuff. 
We can't lock it down and say tomorrow we're going to do X, Y, and Z. It's really about bringing people together. So what's the blueprint for action? You create that common vision, our core assumptions about young people, about their outcomes and their supports. We engage all the stakeholders. We get them convinced that it's in their best interest and young people's best interest to take shared accountability for that vision to make sure it's a reality. We look at a way to get integrated change strategies that are working on all those pieces. We could talk more about that later on. We come up with who's going to be in charge, not in charge of doing everything, but who's going to be in charge of connecting the dots, collecting the data, making sure that we actually have the capacity to look across systems and know what's going on. And ultimately, if we do all that, we actually change the odds for young people. We don't get to stand up at an awards ceremony and say we helped three young people beat the odds. We actually get to stand up and say we have changed the odds for young people by changing the landscape of their communities because we changed the way we do business. You've got there, I won't read it, an example of what it actually takes to take that big picture approach and apply it to a problem. In this case, we just brought 10 places together to change, to focus on changing program quality. And we can talk about that later if you want. It's just a concrete example for those of you who want to think concretely, which I often want to do. But the bottom line is, and I'll just leave this one up, there is a way to take what we know, and all of us know this individually. The only reason I can draw this picture is that I've spent 20 years hanging out with you all, watching what you do, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, seeing where we have motivation and energy, we actually can harness and release new energy into communities to tackle what we think are impenetrable problems and create lasting community solutions if we begin to connect the dots and recognize that all of us are both doing a lot more than we take credit for, but a lot less than we could be doing. So, thank you. <laughs>